In this episode of Mind Pump, the top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast in the world, uh, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners like you. And the way we open the episode is by talking about current events. We talk about our kids. We mention science articles that we've read. So here's what went down in this entire episode of Mind Pump. We start out by talking about the book, Give a Mouse a Cookie. I bet you didn't know there was a message in that. It's not Mm. just a funny kid's book. Uh, Then we talked about disciplining our children and the effective strategies or what we think to be effective strategies. Uh, Adam talked about a newsletter called The Flip Side, which will actually send you arguments on two sides of a topic, which I think is brilliant. Smart. Uh, That brought me to talk about the proposal um, that is in Congress right now, hasn't passed yet, to give everybody $2,000 a month uh, for until the pandemic's over. I guess that means forever. Um, I talked about the the, excuse me, the Stockdale paradox. This is really interesting. We talked about gyms and the impact of what's going on to uh, with gyms. They're going to be having to pivot really hard here very, very soon. Uh, we talked about uh, anxiety, and mine in particular, um, and how I'm using uh, full-spectrum hemp oil to deal with my anxiety. Ned is my favorite company. So what I do is I take a dropper full of Ned hemp oil. And within about 30 minutes to an hour, I feel my body calm down. It helps me sleep. It helps take away, this is for me now, it helps take away the physical symptoms of anxiety. There's no THC in it uh, or very, very low THC. It's perfectly legal, but it's full of other cannabinoids that give you that, that calm feeling. Now, Ned is one of our sponsors and we have a discount for you. All you have to do is go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get 15% off your first purchase. We talked about the beaches in Santa Cruz opening back up. Um, Justin talked about how he liked wearing his favorite Viore shorts. Those are the palm gray core shorts while he went out there swimming. I bet his cakes looked really, really nice. By the way, uh, Viore makes some of the best athleisure wear you'll find anywhere. And look, right now you're at home. You're probably in your ugly uh, gray sweats. Uh, You're not looking very attractive for your partner. Get some Viore stuff. It's just as comfortable. That's actually more comfortable, but it looks good. It's very resilient. It lasts a long time. I wear Viore every single day, and Viore has one of the best guarantees in the market. It's lifetime. You buy some of their stuff and it breaks down, take it back and get something else. Again, it's high quality, super comfortable. Don't look crappy anymore. Get Consider some Viore. your significant other, get please. Some, get some Viore. It's way better than the gray sweat stuff. Uh, anyway, we have a discount for you, 25% off because you're a Mind Pump listener. Go to Viore Clothing. That's V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash Mind Pump. There's a code on the page that'll come up that'll give you 25% off. Then I talked about fake news that's kind of circulating right now. You need to keep your eyes open for that stuff. Then we got into answering the fitness questions. The first question, um, how should you breathe during heavy lifts? So when you're lifting heavy, heavy weight, what is the best way to breathe to brace your core and support your body? (sighs) Next question, uh, what's a good way to balance cardio and running with the MAPS Anywhere program? And really what we did is we went into talking about cardio in general, how you should manage your cardio if your goal is to get strong, speed up your metabolism, burn body fat, or if you just love doing cardio because it feels good for you. The next question, this person wants to know if you can actually lower your body fat percentage without actually losing body fat. I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's possible. We explain in that part of the episode. And the final question, this person wants to know, look, as, as we get older in our 40s, 50s, and beyond, how would you program the deadlift and squat into your routine? And is one more important than the other? Also, all month long, this month, MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro, both correctional exercise type programs, are 50% off. Now, MAPS Prime takes you full through a self-assessment and helps you design an individualized warm-up or priming session for your current workout. So I don't care what kind of workout you're doing now, if you're running, swimming, if you're lifting weights, doing bodyweight exercises, how you prepare your body before your workout actually makes a huge difference. It helps you move better, connect to the movements better, get better mobility, fire more muscle fibers for better muscle growth and better uh, for better results. 
So that's your priming session. But priming sessions are different from person to person. If you have poor shoulder mobility, poor posture, your priming session is going to be different than someone who has maybe hip issues or ankle issues. So MAPS Prime helps you design that for yourself. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is all about correctional exercise. Go through all the big joints of the body, including the spine, find areas where you have issues, and follow the program to work on these issues every single day, 10 minutes at a time, to give yourself better mobility and better connection and less pain. Again, both programs, 50% off. Here's how you go get that discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. That's M-A-P-S-F-I-T-N-E-S-S products.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space, for the discount. And it's t-shirt time. Ah, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. We have five winners this week, two from iTunes, uh, three from Facebook. The iTunes winners are T. Dinkle, Peyton Lane. For Facebook, we have Brock Daglish, Nikki Duke, and Angela DeMarco. All of you are winners in the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Boy, do I feel like an idiot. What? Yeah. That never happens. No, I just, what a moron. I'm so what dis- you, I'm so I'm, so I'm so disappointed in myself. Why? Because I talked shit the other day about children's books, and oh, you said that you should write it. It's easy. Yeah, and so not the reason why I feel like an idiot because of course of all the books that I chose to be like that's a stupid book. There's nothing to it. There's a much there's a deep meaning to it that I had no <laughs> it's idea. All deep rooted. Yes. Give a yeah. mouse a cookie. Okay. Uh, somebody shared this on a forum. I wish I, I remembered who shared it because I'd love to give her a shout out. That's a great book. Um, mm-hmm. And I talked about it on the show because it's like, you know, when you when you read it, uh, and if you didn't know this about it, you would read it probably like how it is. This makes no sense. The sentences are like run on and whatever doesn't really flow or rhyme. It's like made no sense to me. But what I didn't know about the book that it was written in uh, Reagan's administration. It was during a time when uh, one of the big heated debates that was going on in politics was about welfare. Mm. And that's what the book is all about. And well, it's it, well, okay, so it's not specifically about welfare, by the way. It was because I know quite a bit about the, the history behind this book. I, I read that article and then it reminded me that I, I read about this a long time ago. What it's really teaching, of course, they're going to attach it to politics. But what it's really teaching is if you give a mouse a cookie, then he's going to want this. Then he's going to want that. Then he's going to want this. And he needs to learn how to be self-sufficient. Take care of him. Like everybody has to right. take care of themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a direct connection yeah. to welfare. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, it could, it could be, right? But that's not why the guy wrote it. He was writing like a basic- No, a chick wrote it and she wrote it for that. That's what it's- I read all about it after that. After I felt like an idiot, I had she to She specifically wrote it? Yes. For that? Yes. Oh. That's what it was about. Well, now half of everyone's going to be like, I don't want to read that book. No, no. I, <laughs> yeah, so I read it differently. <laughs> now I read it differently to my son, you know what I'm saying? So it's not just like before I have- I mean, and, and this is the part I think we, we were talking about with the, how this came up, right? We we're talking about different voices mm-hmm. yeah. that we use. So my tone is like so different now because I was just reading it like this stupid kid giving a kid a, a cookie. But there's now a, giving the kid like a good there's voice. a lesson. Yeah, there's a lesson now. So as I, after between every time I say it, see son, this is right. you know why we don't want to do this because you think you're really helping the mouse, but you're not helping the mouse oh, here. Geez. Yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> have you have you? There's old fables that have some interest, like thousands of your old uh, fables that um, that have really interesting interesting lessons. There's one about the, I'm going to screw this up. Almost all the, Aesop's fables are like that. There's one about the, mm. is, the, is it an Aesop's fable? The one about the cricket and the ant? Is that is that the one or am I, am I, I don't know. Anyway, I read there was a story about the cricket and the ant, how the ants were working oh, yeah, and saving and mm-hmm. preparing and the crickets just playing music all day and like, oh, you guys are, who cares? Let's just have fun. The sun is out. And they're like, no, no, no. We want to be ready for when Winter comes or whatever. The locusts, and, and then the the you know obviously food dries up, starts to snow. Ants are safe in their in their hill or whatever, and the cricket is like, I have nothing. Like what? What? It's a great lesson yeah. to teach oh, you yeah. know to teach uh, to teach your kids. Like, now I feel like they we've gotten away from that a little bit. At like newer children's books and newer like kids cartoons have yeah. less of a meaning now. I feel like mm. now I don't know if that's just again I'm, yeah, I'm it used to be about scaring I'm, the shit out of kids from staying out of the woods. 
stay out of the woods. Yeah. There's there's wolves, there's bears. Yeah. They're going to eat you. They're going to dress up like grandma. You know, yeah. they're going to do weird things to try and get you. Well, well you guys know the popular song uh, Ring Around the Rosie. Yeah. What that's about. That's the Black Plague. Yeah. That whole song is about the Black Plague. Yeah. It's literally about the the symptoms you get from the Black Plague and then at the end when they say we all fall down. Yeah, it's everybody die. dying. Yeah, yeah. real, real, real uh, uh, uplifting. But if you think about it, it's it's actually quite brilliant. It's like you want you have to kind of lighten the mood a little bit because it's just the reality of what's going on. Yeah. So it's like, hey kids, let's sing a song about the scary shit that's going on right now. Well, yeah. that was like uh, when we watched that documentary on on Mr. Rogers. Like I had, I mean, I hadn't tuned into Mr. Rogers since I was a kid. And so when you're listening to it as a kid, you're just the puppets are playing. They're yeah. the story. T- you're not really. It's a kid. Just like I felt, that's why I felt so stupid about the Give a Mouse a Cookie book is like, I'm an adult. I should know better to try and read between the lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't even read between the lines while I was reading this this little book, right? I had read it like every single night for like two weeks. I, I think got it. self-sufficiency is one of the greatest lessons you can ever teach your kid. Oh, so this is... <clears throat> it has yeah. to be. Boy, you know? this is, this is going to be... Um, you know, I get a lot of DMs about people when I talk about like the, the fatherhood stuff and the challenging things. So one of the challenges that I already know I'm going to have is Katrina is the, the youngest of her family and uh, I'm the oldest in mine. And so the way we were raised was very, very different. And one of the things that um, I know I'm going to have to work on and have a, a, a lot of is I am, I'm very grateful for the adversity that I went through. And I know that it was very important to develop me, developing my character today and so we had this moment just the other, just this, this yesterday, and he's like, he's crawling. He's real close mm-hmm, to like, mm-hmm. like he's not crawling, crawling everywhere yet. It's like he's, he makes a couple crawls. Oh. So we're like, it's any day it's going to start happening. Can right? I just tell you real quick, just to interrupt you, I can, I cannot take, you post in, you know, private, you know, whatever, uh, private pictures and videos of your kid. It's so hard. I have to come over your house and squeeze the shit it's out of him. It's coming soon. It's happening. Well, he's getting really fun, right? I so can't, the, ta- the, can't mi- the milestones are starting to happen, right? That are fun, like oh. and so we're we're getting ready to crawl right now. So it's like every day, I take him uh, upstairs in our in our in our master room, and I, I set him on one side of the room, sit him up, and I go across the room and I play with toys to make him come over. <laughs> And <laughs> wait, wait, you just, you just you're start training. You just there, start playing right? with his toys. Yeah. yeah, you just sit over there in the you boring like side. 20 I do. Yards and I do. Thirty. I do. Yeah. I move across the room <laughs> and I start playing with his toys to get him to, to start crawling over. <laughs> And, uh, Start playing with dollar bills. You train them early. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so uh, I go. Part of why I go upstairs is because you know Katrina just if he as soon as he cries she just she just breaks down as a mother. You know what I'm saying uh-huh. like right away wants to rescue him, and so I'm up there. And um and he's like this was literally like a whole I think it was like six or seven minutes I was actually recording this so I'll show you guys off air the recording, um but I wouldn't share because then people think I'm mean because he's coming he's he starts to he starts to crawl and I'm fuck yeah I'm, I'm so yeah. pumped I'm about to catch video of like his first like crawl across the room right now and so I'm like trying to encourage him and then he starts getting really frustrated you know he, he sprawls out and then he can't get his footing and he's looking at the toys he wants to get to him <laughs> so he's starting to cry. But yeah. I'm still talking to him. Come on, son. You can you do can this. Do you can do Overcome. this. Overcome. Yeah, right? Yeah. And I'm pushing him to do it. Oh, man. I tell you, my heart melted. At one point, he stops crawling for a second, and he's crying so hard, he has to like wipe his tears. And I'm like, oh, God, dude. Come on, son. You could do this. Like I want him just to... And Katrina comes walking. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> How like, dare so, you? Yeah, so yeah. pissed. that She's like, can't you see? He's crying. And he, I'm like, yeah. She's like, he needs more motivation. That's why I put a monster in the other corner. <laughs> yeah. scared of shit. <laughs> so it, it sparks this big debate back and forth between her and I. And she's like, listen, there's going to be plenty of times for you to teach him adversity. And my argument is like, no, it starts right now. Mm-hmm. These are the little things that are... This is hard for him right now is crawling, right? Like, of course, when he's 16, it's not going to be about crawling. It's about be something that's obviously a lot harder and more difficult. And way, way, way worse to deal with. Right. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to explain to her is like, listen, th- this stuff starts to become hardwired right now. Now, listen, I'm going to love the shit out of him, too. So I'm not a father who's just going to be an asshole and be push him, push him, push him through adversity and never show that other side. As soon as we're done, like, I wrap him up and hug him and hold him and mm-hmm. kiss him. I'm proud of you and all, all that stuff. I said, so... I it's be- a good thing you have Katrina for balance. Yeah, well, that's, you know, I know that's that what's I, so the same thing with me, dude. Same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Like these arguments are very common. You know what? That's really, uh, that's such a good thing that you have that, that that's, pr- that's exactly what, uh, what it's supposed to be like, where right. you have one push, one, one, and you end up with a nice yeah. balance. And 
Now, stereo, you know, statistically speaking, it typically is the dad is usually the one that this is just, and it's not always this way, obviously, but statistics will show that it's usually the dad that does this, and it's the mom that's a little softer. You know what's interesting? After I got divorced, and you know the kids would come and stay with me, you became half the, the time. One. I started to take on both roles. Oh, I actually softened tough, up yeah. a lot because, you know, because mom isn't there. Very weird. Oh, I, I can totally only imagine being a single yeah. parent. It's like you're juggling because when you have another partner, yeah, you can lean on them to be that right. I can be kind of tough knowing that she's going to come right behind me and totally, pick them up, totally. and say I love you, and totally. yeah, 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 no, for sure, absolutely. It's really, really strange, but I think that's you know, and you're right. You bring up a great point. Um, they say you know you you want to show your kids consequences when the consequences aren't terrible right and it, when they get older then the consequences become and that, that mm-hmm. this is my this is my point that i was trying to make was that listen i know you think it's not a big deal because it's just him trying to learn how to crawl but that's that's just it it is not a big deal right now. it's a little thing so if i can teach him the, if i can instill this in him now mm-hmm. when he starts to hit other things as he gets a little bit older that it's going to be innate in him yeah. Yeah. versus the other way if every time he cries or every time he struggles we go to save him because just because he's little and he's and it, and he's and it's right. challenging for him then that will be his his innate behavior you know what's cool about this too is uh i mean this is obviously you can think back logically but the way you keep clients uh you know motivated and consistent is you you show them challenge but you also allow them to have little wins mm-hmm. you know what i mean so oh, like huh. he's coming across the room he's crying he gave up you give him a little toy now he has a little bit of a win then he wants to move forward again. You know that that type of strategy, right? Yeah. Uh, which is just, I mean, it's what you do as a trainer. You're, it's effective. Yeah, it's it's because if you if it's so difficult for a client that they just fail all the time, they're oh, discouraged yeah. and they never come back. Going. Well, yeah. I knew I knew this was coming for us because we had our. I mean, before we had a kid, we had we we got a dog together, right? We had Bentley and then we had Mozzie, <laughs> and seems- they're and they're bulldogs, right? So they're all they're stubborn personalities. And she never had a, d- a dog before, and I re- and she was so loving all the time, and it was never discipline. It was like, you know, shower them with love mm-hmm. and affection. And of course, when the dogs don't feel well with it, they always mosey over to her. But then when it comes to respect and listening, like she doesn't have the same response with them because she hasn't instilled that into their their behaviors it's like i and i was that from day one it was very established myself as the alpha the leader of the pack and then when i say stop or i do they they freeze Mm -hmm. because i have that where she can do that and they overrun her and it gets her really and now she's i see her paying for it as they're older because she'll be juggling things in the kitchen doing Mm -hmm. something dogs are misbehaving and she doesn't matter if she yells or does whatever they're not gonna they don't listen the same way as if i come in and do the same thing and i feel I saw I, I saw that in her early, and I thought, oh man, when we have a kid, this is going to be it. She's going to have a hard time when I want to be the one that's yeah. like, you know, push him to be. It's okay that he struggles. It's all right but that it's good. There's two of you. No, you're right. It creates yeah. that balance. And, you're you're, you know. you're right because I know that it, I, I'm very self aware to know that I'm the extreme version because of all the shit that sure. I went through. Sure, right. right. So I have, and I know I'm well. I'm I'm old enough and wise enough to know that. I don't want to. I don't want to put my kids through the same thing I went just because I think that worked out for me. There's got to be another side to that that mm-hmm. I, in which she's definitely going to balance that. Yeah, out they sure. show uh, studies show that um, har- very very disciplined households that have no love actually have some of the worst outcomes. So when you have just discipline, just structure, just got to do it this way, but there is no love behind it, they have really really bad outcomes. The best outcomes are houses that have both lots of love and lots of uh, discipline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So both. You got to show both. Right. So it's so great. that, And you, of course, you're a loving guy too. It's not like you're just yeah. disciplined well, anyway. And, and that's the, where I was yeah. trying to defend myself because yeah. I could tell she was very, you could tell she was upset with me. Yeah, and, no, you're a loving person. And I'm like, listen, I said, I I would totally understand if, if I played that role only. Like if I was just the asshole or just a, come on, make him push through yeah, and yeah. always like, like, no, come on. Like I'm very very loving and playful and show my affection and love to him on a, on a very regular basis but when there's things that I know that we're we're trying to progress him through and that that's one example other examples are like when we're trying to retrain him to mm. sleep in his bed and not come back to bed with her it's like listen we're gonna have some rough nights mm. we're gonna have some nights when he's gonna cry for like Dude, you know what the, 30 minutes plus straight you know what you the reality is that. too the reality is too is that she she may not admit this but she also wants to sleep 
with him in the bed. Of course. You know? Like, no, he's crying. You just want to cuddle oh, with yeah. him, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. I get it. And I get it, too, because I like yeah. that sometimes. Yeah. So when he was going through that whole thing where he was sick, I was the one to say, like, Come, just let him in. I want to I want to yeah. lay with him. Yeah. I know he doesn't feel good. I want him in. I want him next to me, and I want him to feel like that I'm there. Like, so I get that, you know? So You know what's been heavily recommended to me along those lines? Um, there's a book and a course called Love and Logic. Have you guys heard of this? No. Okay, so it's been heavily recommended uh, to, to Jessica and I. Uh, my aunt did the whole thing. She said it was extremely valuable. I've heard great reviews. So we actually signed up for their online course, and we're going to take it. And it's apparently it's when's about- it, When does it start? Uh, so once you sign- Okay, so I hope I get this right. I think once you sign up, you have like six months to just complete all the modules. So it's totally up to you because it's all virtual or whatever. Yeah. Is this through Gottman or different? No, this is something different. But it again, it's been recommended to me by so many people. And Jessica has been reading the book. And there are parts of the, the, the book that she really, you know, that she's really enjoyed. So I'll let you guys know as mm. I go through it. I don't yeah. want to say anything on it because I'm sure I'll misrepresent it because I haven't taken the courses yet. You know, mm. speaking of uh, recommendations, somebody recommended uh, a newsletter, a uh, new one for me to subscribe to. I just subscribed to it uh, last week and I've been getting uh, the emails and I really like it. So I, I thought I'd share on the podcast. It's called The Flip Side, which um, this is cool because- oh, you told me about this. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talked like, I don't know, a, a, a while back about, you know, one of the things that's going to become very important uh, for the generation coming up right now in the future is because the- the Facebook and Google and the algorithms have become so good. They know how to feed you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And that, so one of the greatest challenges, it's a lot of confirmation bias, right? right yeah. Exactly. It's going to continue to feed your own, your own bias. So one of the things that, you know, I know personally, I always actively go do is I go read the, the uh, opposing side, the side that I already disagree with. Um, so I can hopefully learn more, potentially uh, change my mind or strengthen my argument. And so I think the future of, of, you know, reading content online is going to either one, take somebody really active or newsletters and things like this, which I thought this is what's really cool that obviously we're not the only ones that think this way. And there's already companies trying to find ways to cater to people that are, are wise enough to know that they need to read both sides. And I love that. Yeah. So it's called the flip side. And so it, to what it, it the, the newsletter opens up with like a, a very current political topic that's going on right now that just like released the day or two before. And then it actually uh, shows you this is the right side and this is the left side mm -hmm. and gives you how they're reporting that topic each side. Really, really cool. Isn't it funny? Both you, sides, by right? the way, if you cool. want to do this on your own, this is all you got to do, right? Tune in to CNN yeah. or MSNBC, and then tune in to Fox. <laughs> Just right. flip the channel. The same, oh my God. the same topic, reported so cr insanely yeah. different, completely different. It is frightening. Yeah. It's yeah. frightening. It's the I've same done thing. That before, it's yeah. the well, same. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is insane. How is this so opposite? It's crazy. <laughs> That's why it's, I think it's really good that I mean they put it all instead of having to bounce between two channels, yeah. you've got it all in one letter right yep. there. It breaks it down for you, and then it allows you to kind of come you know, up with your own conclusion. You know, speaking of which, um, you know, something really dawned on me um, recently, and that is that our our public school system has done such a terrible job of explaining what va what money actually what gives it value and what it represents. I th I don't think a lot of people I think if you ask them then they can start to say oh yeah that makes sense but I think just con subconsciously we never are taught this that money is only valuable because it represents cuz we all agree it's backed well, by something. <laughs> well well besides that we could all agree you know whatever but it has to it, what gives it value is that it, it represents product services or some kind of efficiency. So the only way if you want va if you want money to be accurate to really accurately represent value, money increases, paper increases when we've made more products become more efficient. That's the only way it happens. Yeah. If we don't do that and we just make more money and give it to people, all it does is reduce the value of the existing money because that new money doesn't, it's not tied to anything. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is, uh, and we're going to see this, by the way, what you're going to see in politics is a, is a, is going to be a contest between who can give more free stuff oh, yeah. because of what's going on. There's a proposal in Congress, hasn't passed yet, but the proposal is to give Americans $2,000 a month, every single month in this, ready? Here's the end date until the pandemic is over. So, this is money not tied oh, wow. to any value. All they're doing is, is creating more money, which just devalues 
whatever money's already out there. So really it's a tax. Yeah. But the worst part is there isn't, if, let's just say they pass this. They pass this thing, $2,000 to everybody, and we'll stop it. Just when like the, the war on terror. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll stop it when the pandemic's over. There isn't a politician on earth that would win an election who says, I'm going to end the checks. So what will end up happening is it'll be forever. Right. <laughs> it would never end. It would yeah. It would never end because if imagine if you were trying to you know win an election, you're like, okay, everybody, you know, we're going to end these checks. Economy's good. Everybody's doing great. And it's devaluing. It'd be like, I'm not voting for you. I want to keep my checks. So I'm like, man, people need to really understand the value of what money actually represents because- if we don't, they're gonna play this uh, like this this magic trick with us constantly and mess with us and promise things and yeah, ah, uh, it doesn't work out. You know, wasn't so that well. universal basic income? Wasn't that the whole like stage that it, I, I believe it's Andrew Yang? Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Last time I said his name wrong, uh, but uh, that was his whole like like his whole policy. He was coming in trying to like, and now they're actually doing that anyways. So it's like it's crazy. Yeah, it's 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 crazy because they can say they can do it, and then you think. Oh, this is going to be just like the ma money I earn from work. It's going to be the same thing. Right. But it actually has devalued uh, all the money because it it's not attached to anything. It's just them, you know, creating, which actually brings me to another thing. You guys, have you guys heard of the, I, I saw a video this morning. I thought that was awesome. Have you guys heard of the Stockdale paradox? No. Have you heard of this? I yeah. haven't. So Stockdale, this is really, it's a very, very um, cool thing to, to kind of ponder, especially right now. So Stockdale was a, one of the highest ranking, um, he was an admiral uh, in Hanoi. This is during the Vietnam War and got captured in the 1960s as a prisoner of war. And he wrote a book. I can't remember what the book was called, but he talks about how he knew, he never knew when he was going to get out because mm -hmm. you're a prisoner of war. You don't know when, when they're going to let you out, if they're going to let you out. They could torture you at any moment. So at any moment they could take him out and they did. They would take him out of a cell and beat the shit out of him and do terrible things to him. This was a very, very scary, you know, uh, just kind of difficult period of time. But he came out of it very strong, very healthy, wrote a book. Didn't he? It, it was like over a year. It was a long time. He was in there for a long time. For years, yes, right? Yes, for a very long time. Yeah. And so they, afterwards, lots of psychologists and, and authors wanted to know, like, how, how did you survive this? Like, this is such a, I can't, personally, I can't imagine of a, of a more challenging, uh, you know, thing to go through. It's not just that you're, you know, if you're in jail, you know when you're going to get out. Yeah. But you're you're in there. You don't know when you're going to get out. They could do anything they want to you whenever they want. You have no control, or you feel seven years. Thanks, Doug. Wow. He was a prison. So seven years he was in there. Seven years of being tortured, probably fed hardly anything. Whatever, right? Yeah. Going through dysentery. Never known, yeah. When when you're going to get out. So what he's what they found was is that he uh, always had very very strong uh, belief and faith that he would get out at some point. So that that was. He knew, like, I'm going to make it through this, hmm. and when I do, this moment will define me and make me a stronger, better person. Hmm. But then there's a uh, another side to it. He also was not an optimist. This is the part that that is fascinating to me, because when they asked him afterwards, who were the people that suffered the most while while who, the people that were in in there with you, who are the ones that just did the worst? And he goes, Oh, that's the optimist. He goes, these are the people that would say things like, oh, they'll let us out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and they weren't out. Oh, they'll let us out by New Year's. New Year's would come. Uh, and they just keep getting crushed. Yes. Yeah. They suffered from a, what he said, they would suffer from a broken heart. Yeah. And so the key, oh, he wow. said, was, and, and uh, there's a book called Good to Great, a great business book. And the author in there uh, talks about this, that the successful businesses are the ones that uh, they, are, they believe that they'll, they'll come out the other end but they're also the ones who completely accept reality. They're not mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. making pie in the sky, you know, dreams. They're saying, all right, here's the reality. Uh, you know, we're in a whatever recession. Things suck. They're probably never so going to go back. They accept the facts, yep. but, but at the same time, yeah, they're not like glorifying like this grandiose vision of being out like at a certain time. No, well, this is, I love that you're bringing this up because this is what's going to happen to a lot of people when, when uh, we do go back, right? So mm -hmm. when, when shelter in place is no longer, and uh, uh, there's definitely a there's definitely a portion of people that are extremely negative. There's a portion of people that are very real about this, and then there's people that are like overly optimistic. And the truth is uh, of this is that there's a very good chance that when things go back, they'll never go back to how they were before. Right. Yeah. And you and you have to know to be okay with making peace with that. Mm -hmm. If you are 
holding in shelter Gotta in place adjust. right now, and you and your attitude is okay. Any day now, we're going to be out, and we're going to be out. It's going to be we're going to be back to normal. We'll be fine. It'll be all like it used to be. Is I don't know. I mean, that reminds me of the Dave Ramsey story that I shared. Like, you know, everybody is getting a call right now. Like, everybody is. It just it depends on what that is for you. Like, yeah. if this is a you know spouse thing, your kids thing, is it a financial thing? But everybody is their, their doors get knocked on right now. And the question is, you know, is this is what we went through right now? Are you aware of what that what your your call is? And will that fundamentally change you for the rest of your life? And will it be a defining moment? And you will change whatever behaviors going forward. It reminds me too of just you know, it's true belief. Like so, it's not like you're you're not riding based off momentum. And and I think that's why we've always tried to steer people away from like always catching this momentum wave and like oh my god everything's so positive, positive, positive. You know, like because we're only presented with either you're an optimist or a pessimist, right? Like th this other option needs to be highlighted more. Like, I think I think it's okay to think and feel positively, but don't but don't uh, feel positive about an a outcome that you expect. It has to be based feel, on reality. Feel uh, what I was going to say is you, be positive about your ability to handle whatever outcome happens. So it's very different. Yeah. If you if you start a business and you're like, oh, and your mind is set, oh, I'm going to make five million dollars right. in five years. You may be setting yourself up for devastating uh, reality if that doesn't happen. Hmm. Instead, what you can say to yourself is. I'm starting a business. I don't know what the outcome is, but I'm positive. Whatever the outcome is, I'll be able to handle mm -hmm. and I'll be able to learn from if it succeeds or it fails. Very, very different. So po the, the, the optimist that he was talking about, and this is why it's a paradox. The paradox is faith that I know I'm going to handle this and I'm going to come out of it better, but also having the discipline to say, here's the reality. So it's, 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 it's optimism in yourself, not in the... And uh, you know the end result, which we don't know what the end result is. And, and look, it's, we're probably not going to be the same for a long time. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at, I'm following very closely the brick and mortar gym industry, which, in my opinion, the brick and mortar gym industry uh, is going to be hit among the the it, hardest. It was a devastating hit. Totally, it they're, was. They're going to have they're going to have to do the biggest changes. I mean, I, I, maybe the restaurant industry, service industries, mm -hmm. travel, mm -hmm. but uh, travel a lot of times is considered essential. I think the brick and mortar gym industry, if they don't have this attitude, they're going to be fucked. You Whoa. already you already saw it, like Gold's Gym shutting down permanently, shutting down tons of locations. The last I counted, there's 30 completely shutting down. 24 Hour Fitness is now looking at bankruptcy. Talking options. about bankruptcy. Yeah. I think uh, that the the gyms that uh, if you're a gym that built your model on uh, lots of people being in your gym, so you know you go to 24 Fitness in prime time, it's packed. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of group exercise classes with lots of people, cheap membership fees in order to feed this model. You're going to have to completely change your model because even if there are no laws against this, I cannot foresee people going to a gym. The volume's going to go way down. No, I, you're not going to want to go in there. Yeah. I actually think that's not the reason why they're they're failing. I think the reason why... So we've seen this in the two decades that we were a part of, of the gym industry, and that was the race to the bottom. Um, Planet Fitness is an example of mm -hmm. this, right? And so, you know, in probably the early or mid-2000s, I'd say... Gyms began began to uh, you know undercut each other like crazy. Mm -hmm. It now became uh, less about you know making your experience in the gym better or the things that the amenities that you had, and it all began or keeping people consistent. Right, exactly. That's what I mean. Keeping mm -hmm. people coming there and adding value to their lives. Right, like a good a good business model was built off of. And it was all about how low can we make this to where people will actually just say, fuck it, I'm paying $9 a month, whatever. Right. I'll just, just keep it. I'll just let it happen. Yeah. And so that's what happened. So almost all, especially 24 Fitness, especially the Planet Fitness, their model is actually built on the success of the people not showing up and utilizing it. Well, uh, you mean built, them sticking around and not getting... That's what, yeah. that's the, that it's built on, we know that so many people will buy this and because it's so low, it doesn't matter. 70% of them will probably not use it three months, but they'll still keep paying us for a minimum. And they've done studies on this for seven months after that. 
So they know they're making all this money off of people that aren't even getting any real value from the business. And guess what? They continue to leverage by it building more and more and more. That's right. Okay, we have enough. We have enough EFT memberships now that pays for this location. Okay, now let's leverage and get the next one. And let's leverage and get the next one. And they've been scaling rapidly for the last 10 years or more on this model. And guess what happened? Is now that this, the rug has been pulled out and now everybody who is looking at their their finances, like most all of us were during this, this time, is like, oh shit, I need to look at all the things that I was spending money on and not using and guess what? When more than half of your 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 model is built on people not using your your shit but still paying you for it, those people all want their money back. It is, and again, if you're if you're a, one of these clubs, Planet Fitness, Twenty Four Fitness, or whatever that built your model around this, think about the environment of a gym like that when most people attend. Now, most mm -hmm. people don't attend these gyms. If you were to look at, and we used to look at this right when we'd run gyms. You could clearly see when the bulk of your members would show up to work out. When you look at all your total amount of members that show up, when do most of them come to the gym? They call it prime time, right? Prime time after work. There's a little bit of a rush in the early morning. And then the rest of the time, it's pretty much dead. There's a few people working out here and there. But for the most part, people come before work and most people come after work. And what it looks like is it's crowded. It's mm -hmm. crowded in there, but it's okay. You know, if you maneuver and you know what you're doing, you could probably get around to work out or whatever, but it's relatively crowded. Okay. These gyms open back up. Now you've got orders from governors that are like, all right, stay, you know, the shelter at home is ended, but here are the new uh, things that we recommend. You want to keep six, six foot uh, distance apart. Okay. You tell me one gym in, that used to run before this all went down that had enough space for prime time where you had six feet between people yeah. doesn't exist. Right. Then they're going to have, then people are not going to want to go to these gyms. Even if the laws don't tell the gyms they have to do this, I'm not going to want to go into a gym that's packed. I'm not going to want to also go to a gym where the equipment doesn't get wiped down every single time somebody uses it. And mm -hmm. group exercise classes are fucked in the way that they used to run. Nobody's going to take a, a, a you know cardio kickboxing class with 40 people in there. Right. They're probably going to have to limit it to like, eight or 10 in the same space. At least for as long as this is all still going on, until we have a vaccine and we see numbers. Until consumer confidence is there, right. which yeah. could take a years. Year. Yeah, it could yeah. take we a year or two years. That and like, and yeah. these gyms are, can't survive a month. They are already showing they can't survive a month of yeah. being shut down. So what, what I think they're going to have to do is they're going to have to go to a higher priced model. Mm. They're going to have to now rely on, because this is how the old model worked. The old model... Gyms like 24 Fitness and Planet Fitness and those kind of clubs lost money on their most consistent members mm. because they're the ones that are paying, you know, they're 20 bucks a month or nine bucks a month like Planet Fitness, but they're using the gym and wearing everything out, you know, five days a week. Yeah. I'm actually losing money on that. I'm making money on the people that are, like right. you said. Yeah. So those people are more likely, the fitness fanatics, I know what's going to happen. The gyms will open tomorrow, let's say. The only people going to show up are the fitness fanatics. The hard course. Yeah, because they're like, this is important. This is something that I, I'm willing to take the risk. This is for my health. Those are the people that the gyms are going to have to now it's, it's, profit off of. It's interesting when you look at the mm -hmm. lifetime. We're so familiar at 24 because it's where we grew up, right? So I'm very familiar with the origin story, very familiar with the the arch of the or the mm -hmm. arc of the the actual business and where where it peaked and kind of where. And it's funny because when it was built, when Mastro first did it, it was built on the value model. I mean, mm -hmm. it, that he was the first one to really start it to, to create like trainer staff and they were doing personal training in the facility and that was all part of the, the actual team there, mm -hmm. the EFT model. The thing was really built on value of changing people's lives. Dude. And then it hit a point where it then became all about how many more can we open up? How much up? can we save? How much can we leverage? How much money can we make off of the people that aren't utilizing it? And just- Bro, 1998 or 99, right after I started there, in, when 24 Hour Fitness had, I don't know how many they had that time, 100 locations. So no, now they have what, 400 something, right? So maybe 100 locations. This is after they merged with Family Fitness. If you wanted an all club membership in the late, in the nineties, you want an all club membership, it costs you three hundred dollars to sign up. That includes the enrollment fee, processing fee, first and last month. It was around three hundred bucks, and you were going to spend forty five bucks a month. You find me a gym in that category now that charges that much. They don't. No, it's way more expensive because they did exactly what you said, and so now that model is fucked. It's going to be totally screwed because in order for these gyms to survive. They have to give the consumer 
a feeling of safety because people are going to be a little scared, which means you need space between members. You need space in group exercise classes. I bet you they're probably going to invest in one-on-one training way more than they ever did because it's a high ticket amount. And they're probably going to have to charge four or five times more per month Mm. in order to keep their doors open. So they're going to rely on the people who are consistent. This is going to be very, very interesting. And I also see the virtual side really starting to take off. I'm really interested to see companies like Peloton and Mir, all that stuff, you know, like they're going to do it virtually because I feel like a lot more people. Tech integration would be interesting. Yeah, totally. Well, there is, man, there's some hope out there humanity wise. I watched this, um, the, the show on Apple right now, it's called house, I believe, but, uh, Sweden, there's this guy in Sweden who created a house for uh, basically he had an idea for this log cabin forever that he wanted to build and he has a family and a growing family and one of his kids actually he found out had autism and then after this whole thing like it it, it sort of sidetracked him from like creating his ultimate dream house and like this was his whole thing was to create this house and build it and do all this stuff so he started researching more about it and I had no idea. I've never seen this done before, but he basically created like a house. So he built a, a log cabin type house, but on the outside of it was a greenhouse. So he, the outside shell of the entire thing, this huge house was covered with, you know, all this like glass and, and kept like this, this constant temperature. So he could have, uh, you know, vines of grapes and he has like all these trees and all this like internal like nature and like goes outside pick stuff from the garden for dinner and all this kind of stuff anyways like the whole thing it was just so amazing i had no idea like like that was an option you know it's like it's just crazy to think like people like think way outside the box because now it's all self-sustainable he has like all his septics uh like kind of hooked up to where he could reuse it within the plants the plants use that he doesn't have to you know use the the city's uh, septic like he's got all like the uh, natural energy and stuff he collects That's for awesome. it dude it's it's insane and like uh, the whole thing i guess it, the the healing aspect of it for his his son has been uh, amazing like, oh so it was really motivated to keep his son yeah oh wow that's great yeah i just got so inspired by it i was like i can't you know and i'm not like as radical as being like oh my god i'm gonna go make a a greenhouse house out of this but it was like almost like i was considering it because of all of the uh the benefits that it was providing his family it was unreal so you went you bought it fiction or non-fiction no this is real oh it's a real story yeah Yeah. so you instead went you bought a fern (laughs) <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. well, I got inspired. I just planted some plants. You, you want to know what's funny? Yeah. This whole time you're talking about this house with the plants on the outside and yeah, all yeah. these plants on the inside. Yeah. And what's going through my mind is like, this fucking hell of spiders in that house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd like that. <laughs> you know what I'm of course you'd, you'd think <laughs> that. Yeah, I was all excited because I'm like, I get excited by nature. Like yeah. the top of it, he had this this uh, this deck. And so everything, like when it was like snowing outside and everything, everything was all like moderate temperature, 70 degrees. And they're like playing ping pong. And stuff. Oh, wow. There. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, dude. Yeah. Have you, Sal, spiders, though. Sal, would you say you have you always been like an anxious person? Are you somebody who, has, uh, or is that something that as you got older? It's or? weird. It depends. It really depends on the, uh, on like what spiders it, or not. You, well, <laughs> well, it really does. It really does depend. Like there's certain things that'll make me, you know, I'll give you an example. Like the first time we put the mics on or, you know, when I was on camera recording the first Maps Anabolic, I'd never done anything like that. It felt very natural. had no anxiety around it. I know a lot of people would feel anxious around that. Um, but, you know, you, you you know, if I'm in a room like Justin's talking about, I'm probably going to be thinking about spiders. <laughs> you know, yeah. is there going to be a spider in my hair? Yeah. You know, yeah. I got to get it out. It's uh, part of nature, bro. Yeah. It, you know, right now is a very anxious uh, challenge for me because I don't like getting sick and I can be a, a little bit of a hypochondriac and think that everything's terrible. And of course we're in a pandemic and dude, I'll tell you what's saving my ass right now though. Right. I will tell you what is saving my ass. Uh, Ned, yeah. every single night I take the the hemp oil and oh man, it, it brings the physical, I, it's not going to change my thoughts, but when you physically feel tense, now what and you what can't is it, sleep? what is it though about the the hemp that actually causes that? Because I, I actually use it very similar. So it's funny you brought up that you don't get anxious on on the camera or the pod stuff like that. 
I uh, still to this day I don't like the the camera thing. The top I have no problem. I can be in a room, which is weird, right? Uh-huh. I'm opposite of what most people are. I can be in a room with hundreds, thousands of people, and me talking to all of them, totally comfortable doing that, which is weird. Yeah. And then I get in a, a room, just me and Doug, and I'm talking to the camera, and it, I get that anxiety. So I anytime I have to shoot content for us with the camera, I always take a couple drops of that. It just <laughs> it settles me. It set it settles me down. But what is it that's actually happening? That that causes me to feel better that way, which is very similar to how you're using it. Yeah. So the the way that the cannabinoids in uh, in hemp oil work, so THC itself is psychoactive, right? So if you have uh, like marijuana, THC itself has these psychoactive properties. CBD and other uh, cannabinoids that are in 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 the Ned hemp oil are not psychoactive. They don't make you feel high. That's why it's legal. That's why you could buy it and order it and it's not, you know, you're not going to get in trouble for it. But what they do is they uh, they improve your body's ability to use its own natural cannabinoids. So the whole reason why THC even works in humans to begin with is because we have these receptors that we've had for probably since humans have been on earth and, and before that our own that we produce our own natural cannabinoids that attach to these receptors and their function among other things is to make us feel good feel calm in fact um, some people would say that this is one of the one of the reasons why you get a runner's high if you're running and pushing and running and pushing they've shown in studies that your body will release its own you'll get a burst of natural uh, cannabinoids they call them endocannabinoids because they're from your body and they make you feel calm. They're anti-inflammatory. Um, they they reduce pain. That's why people get the runners high. This is some speculation, but people get the runners high, and all of a sudden the run feels good mm-hmm. and not so painful. Um, mother's breast milk at certain times of the day will have high amounts, uh, relatively high amounts of natural cannabinoids. If you've ever you know this, you watch your son breastfeed at certain times of the day, and they get that milk drunk, like uh, yeah, like mm-hmm. chill and relaxed or whatever. They think it might have something to do with that. So when you're taking the the you know the hemp oil extract, you're not getting the THC, but what these cannabinoids do is they improve your own body's ability to use its own cannabinoids. So what you feel is the feeling of what your natural cannabinoids are doing, but just better and a little stronger. That's what happens. So and to me, this is like you know in our space, it, you know we partnered with Ned a long time ago and when it well before it became like the thing like then all of a sudden we saw it became very popular in the fitness space and the way i see most people it's really i think it's silly the way i see people uh promote it and sell it like a recovery thing because all those things burn or something well no it's just you know you see it in the muscle building community that they're they're taking it after a workout because it's going to help recover and it's it's pitched like it's going to help build like i've never used it with those intentions of like i'm this is to help my recovery or it's going to make me recover and build more muscle it's like it doesn't i don't see that i don't see that being anything worth i mean you uh making sure you hit your macro intake or getting good rest trumps the shit out of that Mm -hmm. all day long but I do see the value in uh, when I get anxious or have those moments of setting, and it help, and that's how I use it with my dogs. Same thing I use with them. Anytime I travel with them, they get super anxious to the point where Bentley starts panning. He looks like he's gonna have a heart attack. So anytime we go somewhere, like I drop, I drop it in their mouths before we take off, and I swear it freaking settles down. It doesn't calm them to the point where they're like sedated. No, no, no. You don't feel just, sedated. No, it's not a sedated feeling. It's no. just you feel a little bit more at ease. Totally. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And it's right now, it's completely saving my ass. So I'm very appreciative of that. But, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure a lot of everybody's levels are, are extra high right now, Dude. too, in terms of just being like un, uneasy and, and anxious. Yeah. And, it's This is an exercise and, and, and this is self-growth time. Yeah. That's what it is, really. Well, uh, they finally opened up the beaches. Thank God. Oh, in Santa Cruz? Oh, yeah. Oh, they did. Yeah. So I, I drove didn't by the other day. Yeah, but they don't have any of the uh, the parking lots aren't open, but they're allowing people to finally get back uh, like on the beach, uh, and so it, it's great. I, I mean, I just ordered up some more some more like shorts and core shorts from Viore, and I went out there and like was uh, you know going in and having some time with with the kids, like walking on the beach again. It was just nice to be you know in nature and be allowed to be there because it was just like it was tough, man. Like. Uh, 
like just staying around the house the whole time and they want you to stay like local so you don't go like far to a different like mm. location and beach and so there's like this cross pollination is there anybody it. enforcing like distance like stay six feet away from other yeah. people yeah so there's cops there and everything and they're like watching with their masks and everything and most people are out there still have their masks on and stuff um but at least i mean we could walk out there and they didn't want you to stay there for very long too they were regulating that as well dude there's been protests in uh parts of the country where people are like i forgot where it was but they were protesting we want to work we want to work and the you know the shutdown or whatever yeah um and that's been happening but there's also fake news around it like crazy so i saw today there was people were circulating this picture uh that th it was like a swastika and like crazy posters and shit and fact checkers went back and said this was at a bernie sanders rally like like a year ago this is not uh, uh what's happening right now so i think what's happening right now is China and Russia and other countries are trying to promote more division by showing Ugh. that the people who want to go back to work are being super irrational wow. and the people who don't want to go back to work or whatever scared. Oh, I wonder if that post that my my buddy sent me this morning then was like something like that because he sent me this this video. Man, that sucks. This video of this lady who was in a in a Dodge pickup, I believe, and there was it looked like a, a you know, a doctor or a nurse that was in their scrubs and had a mask on and was standing in standing in the middle of the street stopping traffic and uh, the this lady was screaming out her window to if you want communism to go back to china and had like a you know America is free, like yeah. thing, and hanging out her truck, and she was like totally yelling at wow. the guy. I don't know; so, it might be real, but you know, it, it might not be. We've there. Look at here's the deal: we know for a fact that they use social media to 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 fuck with us. Yeah, to so, manipulate. Yeah, I mean, we oh. do our we do the same shit. I'm well, sure, my sense them. is that like they're being they're starting to 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 take it into tiers and like phases, and so this is like one phase is like they're starting to kind of reopen up mm -hmm. uh, state parks and all you know and like uh, beaches and things like you know and just reintroduce like places where people can actually congregate again, and then you know the next phase I'm sure they're going to do like certain types of businesses they'll probably start to reopen and all that. Like I think that there is a lot of that pent up uh, like unrest. And, like, I want to work and let me work. And, and we and have to. We have to. We, we have to let it happen. Now expect this. This is. We need to expect it. First off, uh, we need to show the world that we do this stuff voluntarily. We don't want to. We want to confirm that Americans can go out voluntarily, put on masks, distance ourselves, do the right stuff. But inevitably, what we should expect are some spikes in mm -hmm. infection. This is going to happen, and don't freak out uh, about them. Do the right thing, but we're going to see some. That's just yeah. natural. What are, so speaking of that, I haven't been. You've been watching that more than anybody now. Is the the curve? What is it looking like right it, now? It definitely seems to be flattening uh, in the in the in America and in, uh, lots of places in the world. So it's just flattening. We haven't seen it actually start to decrease. In yet. some places you have, but okay. not here yet. Yeah. In the U.S., it seems to be flattening. Yeah. Now remember, a flat curve means it lasts longer too. So it doesn't go up as fast. But when you flatten it out, you you tend to see it last a little longer because we don't get the herd immunity that you would get from everybody getting it all at once. But that would cause lots of problems. So, Got it. first question is from Double O Silk Drop. What is the best way to breathe during your heavy lifts? Mm. You know what? That's I'm glad that it was asked this way because breathing during heavy lifts is a little bit different than breathing doing yes. uh, during high rep yeah. sets or when you're doing uh, stretches or mobility type stuff. So the best way to breathe when you're doing a heavy lift, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume this is really low reps too. So we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about heavy, low rep sets. Yeah. You wanna take a, a deep breath in and then you wanna brace your core. Then you wanna do your heavy lift. As you come up, you could do two things. Either one, if it's, especially if it's really low reps, you can let your breath out at the top of the rep when you're done. So you hold your breath the entire time. Or two, you let it out while bracing your core and, and keeping your diaphragm active and tight. So it sounds like... Yeah, you know, I call it like, like breathing through your teeth because yeah. you're really staying like braced and tight, but like you're it's it's like restrictive air that's coming out. Some yes. some will just flat out say hold breath. Like it's yeah. a lot of like your uh, even your your most advanced power lifters. Uh, when they do a heavy bench press, a heavy deadlift, or a heavy squat, they get in position they and they brace their core. Mm -hmm. And when they brace, they tense and hold breath for that rep. Yep. And then at the top of the rep- But they're is, still going, Ugh! 
Oh, which is air is coming out. That's right. I was so, just gonna say yeah. it's that I, I I will allow the the breath to come out, but I'll I'll do that. I'll grunt yeah. or I'll make a sound, and that's my way of letting the breath out very controlled. You know, they, they, they by the way, this is a technique they teach in a lot of practices in yoga. I was going to say, have you done any of those pregnancy uh, breathing classes? No, yet with not the yet. Do they do that? <laughs> those are fun, dude. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah, they do that. I just, you know, when I picture that whole process, <laughs> that I picture her just like looking at me like an asshole when I'm trying, hey, honey, remember, <laughs> breathe like this. It'll be better. You know, yeah. the hilarious thing is I was in a class with that and you have the, like for, for the husbands or the guys there or whatever, they made us like put our hand in ice and, and hold it and like try and breathe through it. I'm like, this has nothing to do with, with the pain they're going to experience. They're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like, yeah. make, get I'm like even, I can do this all day. Get, get <laughs> you, know? you in even bigger yeah. tr- trouble, honey. Listen, I know, I know what it's like. I remember I had my hand, hand in the air. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, He's bringing it up yeah. like, yeah, yeah like mid, you saw how long mid I did push. it for. Come yeah. on, yeah. Oh, dude, piece <laughs> yeah. of cake. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you're, you know, again, it's in lots of practices. Yoga teaches uh, a breath that comes through the back of the throat. They'll say where you're tight and controlled and you breathe out. Uh, martial artists uh, teach us a lot. Boxers. You ever hear a boxer, um, you know, shadow boxing? Mm-hmm. What do you hear? <laughs> right? uh, Muay Thai fighters. Yep. So your breath, uh, actually, it's uh, it, it's a it's a big part of you being able to exert maximal force. And the reason is, when you hold intense in your breath, you're maintaining really really good uh, tight stability um, throughout your core. So when you're getting those heavy breaths, you deep breath in. Hold it. Like imagine you're doing a squat. Go down as you come up. Either continue to hold your breath or do what I do, which is breathe out, but through a grunt or you know through pressure. Well, this is where those core activating techniques kind of come into play when you're doing like cat cow or whatever, and you're just trying to brace and then teach your client then how to keep that tightness, but now breathe through it and like you know be able to still do that because you want it to be natural too. At the same yeah. time, you don't want to think you have to consciously think about how you're breathing while you're doing your reps. You end up getting dizzy and and it, <laughs> like ruins your performance. Well, the, the only the only time I see this go wrong is when when you give that adv- we give that advice to kind of like hold your breath through it, which is totally fine for a heavy lift, a single lift, uh, is you hold it. It's someone who's lifting like, let's say five heavy reps and they think it's a good idea to hold your breath the entire time through five reps. No, you'd have to, you'd have to breathe in between reps. Right. Every rep you reset, right? Mm-hmm. You, it, whether that be deadlifting, squatting, bench pressing, overhead, whatever you're doing, you can hold and brace for that one lift and then breathe again, hold and brace for that next one too. Really, you can't really, even catch your breath at the top. Sometimes that's what I'm you have saying. to take two or three yeah, breaths. Yeah, no, absolutely. But like, now this 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 isn't necessarily what you'd want to do with a high rep set. Right. Like I'm not doing 20 reps of squats and doing that for every rep. I would no. end up yeah, no way. It wouldn't work. I'd be <laughs> it would be 30 minutes of squats. So with with that, with the higher reps, you you tend to breathe in on the way down, breathe out on the way up. Now, that's that's the advice. That is the that is the generic typical advice, but because you know, we advocate for manipulating with tempo, meaning that there's times where you might do a four, six second negative. Yeah. You're not going to breathe on that cadence. And so what I used to tell clients is the most important thing when we're lifting weights and we're doing this is that you remember to breathe because some people will, because it's challenging or hard, they get in their head so much. They, they hold their breath the entire time because they're like, mm-hmm. look, paying attention to what they're doing. They don't realize they're tensing up and holding breath. I do this like uh, when I'm concentrating, it's a bad habit of mine. Like I'll be, doing something and I'll be really focused on it. I'm so focused that I my I stop my breathing to like <laughs> and then all of a sudden you hear me go <sighs> yeah, yeah because I don't so clients do this sometimes when they exercise. So I don't do that when I exercise. I do that when I'm like thinking on something, whether it be work or paper, some shit that I'm doing. That will cause me to do it. Some clients do that when they're exercising through 10 or 15 reps. Mm-hmm. You don't want to hold your breath. You want to breathe. Breathe in and out, normal. That's the idea while you're doing that. The only time that I would say you can hold your breath is for single reps at a time yeah. at, 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 when you're doing you heavy You want lifting. it for tension. Okay, now there's an opposite side to this. Let's say you're doing uh, yin yoga or static stretching, deep static stretching, or let's say you're you're on a foam roller and you're really trying to work out you know, muscles and tight areas, don't hold your breath yeah. because holding your breath sends a signal to the central nervous system that says stay tight. When you're doing static stretches, uh, which if you do them properly can be a part of a mobility program, that, but properly, you got to be done right. You don't want to hold your breath while holding a well, long static stretch. It's all about stretch. the exhale. You I mean, want to The you exhale relax. is the release. Yeah, you want to relax yeah, into so. the stretch and breathe. You don't want to be tight and tense. Right. Because it'll prevent performance in that particular, you know, uh, modality or whatever. So, breathing is very important. Uh, just think of it this way: holding your breath or breathing tensely—that's when you want tension. 
breathing smooth and slow, that's when you want things to be relaxed. Next question is from Amana Med Kelly. What's a good way to balance cardio and running with the MAPS Anywhere program? Yeah, well, it depends on your goals. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm figuring this out for myself right now. Again, this is something I, I constantly have to relearn. But because we're, you know, because our jobs involve sitting all day. So what we do now is we literally sit in front of a mic, stand in front of a camera, or work uh, on the internet, which involves no activity. Yeah. I track my steps and I could honestly especially now that we're kind of well self- we did that in anywhere right Doug that's done in anywhere right? yes. yes step we gave step goals right mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. we so did count. Yeah. so I was I, that's where I was going so what I'm figuring out for myself is that uh, wow I get no steps every single day so now I've made my goal to get about eight to twelve thousand steps a day well here's what I've noticed when I've done that yes I've increased my neat and I've increased my activity I'm actually getting better results with my resistance training and the reason why I'm making that 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 argument is because I want Sometimes I think people think we mean to say no cardio whatsoever because all cardio reduces muscle gains. That's not true. If it improves your health, uh, it will probably give you a better ability to build muscle. The, the, re- the way that cardio gets in the way is when the cardio becomes so dominant that you're always constantly training endurance, right. in which case you have competing you know, strength or endurance, and your body will give you a little bit of each, but not a lot of either one. Yeah, that's one. why I like uh, the activity and monitoring the activity. It's just like, it's something that, yeah, you can throw cardio in there, and it could be a form of cardio, but at the same time, it's it's about the the total amount. So the the, the amount that you're moving th- throughout the day is important. And it's it's making sure that you know you're you're getting all that that en- energy expenditure and you know you're able to like monitor your your fat you're you're able to like you know keep keep it like nice and active get everything all the systems working correctly so it is a, a vital part to it but you know in, in terms of like having intensity uh, the intensity once we ramp that up can kind of take over then uh, that signal of strength that we're trying to promote well there's there's two types of uh, ways that I recommend this, and it would be based off of uh, how how this that where this person falls. So if you're somebody who is who wants to do cardio or is doing cardio because of the uh, relief that it gives you stress wise, and it's a, a great time, you enjoy it. It's very relaxing for you. Um, you your energy goes up when you when you go for a nice run or whatever like that. Then I mean, program it as accordingly. I mean, if you enjoy doing it and 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 it's therapeutic for you and it gets you moving, and you enjoy doing it, then uh, by all means, do it how you you like. Uh, if you're somebody who's coming to me and say you you want to do cardio because you want to maximize burning body fat, totally different. Uh, and that if you're asking me like that, then I I would handle you the same way I handle all the competitors. So anytime I train a competitor. Obviously, uh, if, if out of all the clients I've ever trained, uh, it's it's the most important where it's, it's dialed as we can be and maximizing fat burn and muscle building. So everything that we do is very methodical, uh, and that includes how do we include cardio. And so if you're being coached by me and you want to maximize body fat loss, I'm not going to like just say, you know, oh, we go do 30 minutes a day of cardio, uh, generic like that. What I make all my clients do is, we need to know where your baseline is of movement, like Sal is alluding to with steps. Okay, so you on an average day, you only step six to eight thousand steps. So the way I start to prescribe, you know, cardio or movement, I prescribe movement first. Okay, you're six to eight thousand. Now I want you to get eight to ten thousand steps every single day. Don't let it be less than that. And I inch them up through steps and movement. Now, eventually, if you if you stay consistent with that, like you, I would if someone's been coaching with me for months and months getting ready for a show, is I got them at six or 8,000 steps. Eventually, they're, I've worked them up week over week over week to where they're doing like 20,000 steps in a day. Now, when you're getting 20,000 steps in a day, to do that in walks can get really challenging. To only, to if like if you, especially if you have a sedentary job, you sit down or you're on the computer or you're at home because of this shelter in place, if I told Sal right now, Sal, get 20,000 steps. I'd have to go on like six or seven 30-minute walks or longer. Which would be really tough to do. Yeah. It would be much easier for him to go for an hour run to mm-hmm. get those steps. So that's how I would prescribe to clients is let's just keep increasing the steps until you have a really hard time getting those walks in. And now it's becoming challenging just time-consuming wise. Now I say, okay, go ahead and add a 30-minute run in there to accomplish those steps. So we still follow kind of the step rule. But now I'm allowing you to use, you know, more cardiovascular training to get to it because obviously if you 
walk to, to 10,000 steps, it takes a lot longer if you run to 10,000 steps, mm-hmm. significantly faster if you run it. So that's how I start to introduce the higher intensity cardio is actually through steps. And by doing that, you'll see one, if you're, you're, you're lift, hopefully strength training, you're doing anywhere or one of our programs, you're going to see the the, the benefits from the lifting as you're progressing, you're moving more, so you're going to get see calorie expenditure, so you should see body fat re- reduce. You're not sending a signal to the body that you're primarily doing cardio and it's not beneficial to have muscle on it. You're just walking. So we don't want to we don't want to start really running until later on. And that's how I recommend someone who's trying to maximize body fat loss. It's, it's different than someone who's doing it for, for health. Perfect advice. And by the way, I keep getting DMs uh, on this. Maps Anywhere, yes, is still half off. Um, we still have it half off. The code is white50. So if that's something you're interested in, you don't have to DM me. It's still going on. Just use that code and you'll get the 50% off. Next question is from one Conur. Can your body fat percentage decrease without actually losing fat? 100%. Yeah. Well, okay. So I, I remember years ago when I figured this out, like, it was like before I became a trainer and I started figuring out body fat percentage, and I actually learned how to test body fat um, before I even took a certification course. I actually bought one online and tried to do it on my cousin or whatever. And uh, it was interesting. I, I gained weight. And my measurements would go down. I thought I was doing something wrong. Like, how is this possible? My, my body weight went up, but my body fat percentage is going down. I couldn't figure it out. And then, you know, my cousin who is better at math than me <laughs> than I am, he's like, well, yeah, it's a, if you have the same amount of body fat on your body, but you weigh more, yeah. that same amount of body fat is a Lean smaller percentage. Mass. It's a smaller percentage now. So if, uh, you know, if you weigh 100 pounds and you have 10 pounds of body fat on you, then you're at 10% body fat. 10% of your body is fat. If you went to 200 pounds and you still have only 10, 10 pounds of body fat, now it's half. Now it's 5%. You just went down in body fat percentage because it's a smaller percentage of your overall body weight. Not to mention, you've also sped your metabolism up by doing this. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And this, I love talking about this because it's probably, I think, I think this was a young guy who's asking this question, but- the people that really need to perk up and listen to this this conversation are my clients or the listener who has a a large body fat percentage and has a long journey ahead of them of losing weight or losing fat. And this is a really hard concept to get them to understand is that that is actually what I want to do with that person. So client comes in 50 pounds overweight or more. And they say, Adam, uh, I don't feel good, all the, all the symptoms of why they're there, right? And I want to change this. Where do I start? I actually want to start right here. I don't, I don't want to decrease you on the scale, but I want your body fat percentage to go down, which may mean you may, be high, you may have hired me to lose 50 pounds on the scale because you thought that's what you wanted to do. When I got you to understand that we really want to just lose fat, we want to keep your muscle, you understand that. Then a month has gone by, and I gained you three pounds. You went up three pounds. Now, the if you can't explain this to a client, you could lose your you could lose your job really quick. You need to explain this. You need to learn to explain this because what the, the client needs to understand is that is a excellent place to be mm-hmm. to have added three pounds, even though your goal was to lose fifty pounds, to add three pounds to the scale but your body fat percentage went down a percent or two. Mm-hmm. That that What that tells us is that you've lost fat off your body, but you've also added muscle, which means we, and we know muscle tissue needs more calories to stay on your body. So if you're a higher weight and in more of its muscle than it is fat than what it was when you started with me, that means you've got a faster metabolism and you're leaner than when we started, even though... The scale says two pounds heavier. It makes it easier to continue to lose fat because one of the biggest challenges for people who are who have a lot of body fat to lose, one of the biggest challenges is not to lose the initial 10 pounds or 15 pounds. The hardest thing is to lose the last 10 or 15 pounds. And then what's even harder than that is to keep it off. And so what, what Adam's talking about is literally setting you up for success long term. That's what you're setting up for. Now we're having a faster metabolism. And that means that the 50 pounds is more likely to be gone later, and it's much more likely to be off forever. The other point that you want to make with people is, you know, if you're, you know, uh, 200 pounds and your body fat percentage went down and you didn't lose any weight, you lost size. Remember, body fat takes up more space yeah. 
uh, than muscle does. Body fat's fluffy. It's not as dense. So five pounds of body fat versus five pounds of muscle, you can cle- see a clear difference. It takes up more space on your body. So I used to, what I would do with my clients is I would show them the body fat percentage, then I would do circumference measurements and yeah. say, okay, you, you, you gained two pounds, but your waist went down a quarter of an inch and your thighs went down you know, a, a quarter of an inch. So you actually lost size, which at the end of the day, nobody gives a shit how much you weigh anyway. Right? This is such an important conversation. It's also the bone that I have to pick with shows like The Biggest Loser is because technically what we're seeing when we see that is not a good thing. So if a client came to me and and this is later, right? This is later on in my career. Early on in my career, I fell right into the, like the biggest loser type of trap and that that mentality of, mm-hmm. you know, just let's burn, let's burn as much as we can, let's lose as much as we can, as fast as we can, because that's what they want. But later on in my career, I realized that that was a trap. So if I if I the same client hired me, okay, and this is and you got to get good if you're a trainer listening on communicating this. If you hired me to lose fifty pounds. And you and that first month goes by, and I lost you ten pounds. I didn't do a good job. Mm-hmm. That's let that sink in for a second. You want to lose fifty pounds, thirty days in, and I lost you ten pounds on the scale. I didn't do a good job. I would much rather see you have stayed the same or potentially increased your weight because we put a lot of energy and focus on building muscle and not so much on just losing weight. Mm. The weight thing will be easy. It will be easy if we build your metabolism up first. If we just go chasing the scale and the weight right away, sure, I could I could have lost you 15 pounds in the month instead of 10. If I would have just made you eat less calories and ran you more, just like what we see on Biggest Loser. But what I know is that sets you up for failure. That's why 85% of those people put all the weight back on and some is because it's a terrible way to go after that. Next question is from Michael Lifts 247 As we get into our 40s and 50s, how would you program the deadlift and squat and is one better for us as we age? Okay, so um, yeah, okay, still so doing it. I'm going to answer the last part, is one better for us uh, as we age. Okay, um, let me rephrase the question. As we get into our 40s and 50s, should I practice and maintain my ability to squat and bend over and pick things up? Yes. Yeah. You should. Ha- I hope you maintain that till the day you die. I was gonna say, like, I I could see myself squatting and deadlifting when I'm 80. I hope. I, those are fundamental human functions. So y- now, is one more important than the other? I hate that question because they're both very important. But I guess if I had to pick one over the other, I'd say the squat probably edges out the deadlift in terms of, you know, function. But they're both uh, extremely important. How would you program it? Really depends on the individual. I think. Uh, for the average person, squatting and deadlifting once a week and practicing once a week is probably, so long as you have good mobility and all that stuff, you're probably okay. But the key is going to be to train yourself in a way to be able to maintain good mobility and form in those exercises as you age. And if you start to lose mobility, if you notice that in your 50s, I can't squat like I used to. Don't abandon the squat. Address the reason why you can't. Well, I, and I think too, like like treating both of these with the, the proper intent and like uh, you know making it a skill that you want to like maintain the whole time is is up, utmost importance. And I think why it, it doesn't seem like you'd still do this when you're older is, is a lot of people that have the the intention of always pring or always yeah. having to have these these aids in terms of like oh my my knees kind of hurt so I'm going to work through that pain and. I'm going to keep trying to add load. I'm going to wrap my knee. Yeah. And so they're <laughs> going to do all these different things to just try and, and sort of patch up uh, where the holes are instead of actually going and working on the holes uh, simultaneously and, and, and reinforcing their joints along that journey. I think that's that's something that's totally disregarded, which uh, is not the way that I, I foresee uh, myself going through that, uh, you know, as I age and, and you know, going into to, to the later years, even like I want to maintain both of those simultaneously. So I was asked... Um recently on one of my uh, Instagram Q&A things, uh, if I were to pick three movements that I could only do for the rest of my life, what would those three movements be? And I ch- and they said, and then why? And so I said, squ- squat, deadlift, and overhead press. And the reason why is not because I think those three exercises are, are necessarily the better, the best three exercises that anybody could possibly do. That's not the reason why. Um, although they are arguably three of the best movements mm-hmm. up there. The reason why is I know if I can properly do an overhead press, properly squat, and properly deadlift, that I'm 
and I'm late in my years, 70, 80, 90 years old, I am definitely probably pretty healthy overall. Right. Uh, as far as from a movement perspective, uh, I, it means I've got pretty good. So, and those are the areas I, I pick the three that I think we, people lose. Like to do an overhead press at the age of 60 or 70 is very impressive. Yeah. Uh, uh, not a lot of people can, can hold a barbell straight up above their head. Uh, even if it's lightweight, straight up above their head. Most with, of them can't oh. do it with no weight. Right. I used to train people in advanced age, and they could not they can't straighten even raise their, their arm straight up. They could right. not straighten their arm up. So the point of me explaining that was it's not the exercise. It's the, the ability to be able to do that exercise. And so the, why I'm bringing that up with this question is that's the answer to this for this person with, when it comes to squatting and deadlifting. It's, it's not so much the exercise itself. It's the ability for you to do it. And if you can't do it because you're older, the goal should be to get to a place mm -hmm. to do it. Who cares if it's 200 pounds, 100 pounds, whatever. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you can perform a squat with good form, perform a deadlift with good form, and do an overhead press with good form. If you can do, if you can do those things, you're going to have a very health, healthy shoulders, very healthy hips, have a strong back, things that are extremely important as we age. And if you struggle with those things right now, the worst thing you could do is to abandon them. Don't abandon them. Work on getting better at them so you can perform those movements. And if you can stick to those three movements, because I tell you what, I foresee myself this way as I get older. I mean, I of the three of us, I would say I'm probably, I don't know, maybe Justin Eichler. Sal's the most neurotic when it comes to exercise. Consistent. Yeah. <laughs> right? Sal's the most neurotic like when you it comes to that. Yeah, yeah, you can call it however you want. <laughs> Consistent, and, neurotic. And then, uh, you know, Justin and I, Justin and I, I don't know, we're probably similar to that and Doug. Uh, and I think that... There's highs and lows. I, I see myself like this. Like, there's a lot of times. I already do this now, and I'm, I'm not even 40 yet, where, you know, I, I might just be doing squatting those movements. That's it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I and and all the things that uh, that make me do those movements well. So what I what includes that is like the mobility webinar that I just did. Those types of mobility exercises, those all help me perform those three movements. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Or working on Indian clubs. Like I know Justin likes to do all those things. But the reason why he does all those things is so he can do those three movements I just yeah. said. You know the reason Otherwise why it goes away. Right. The reason why he does all those crazy Indian club and May spell stuff when because he does that. It allows him still to overhead press with comfort and strength really well. If you do all the 90-90 stuff and the combat stretch, that'll allow you to squat and deadlift to good depth and to, with good form. Yep. That So I'll always be doing things, and that to me, I'll always be watching that. Like, can I mm -hmm. still deadlift a decent amount of weight? Can I? It doesn't need to be my, my PRs when I was younger and uh, training seven days a week. I want to be able to just be strong enough to be able to – be doing at least my body weight or more in these movements, and if I'm doing that, man, that that's I'm going to be very happy with myself well, in my we, 70s and 80s. Yeah, we we ever like every now and then we'll get somebody asking about uh, weight belts and, and you know the proper technique with those or like like shoes, elevated shoes, and all these types of things. And you know, like I think it's great that uh, you want to you want to get in there and be able to lift heavier and be able to be feel more support and feel good. But now you're negating the other like half of training that you should be focused on, which is making sure everything uh, joint wise is accounted for. Like I can go down to that depth. I can uh, withstand that amount of load on my back and brace properly. I just want to, I want to personally train myself like thinking into the future of when I'm 60, when I'm 70, when I'm 80, like I want to, I want to be able to pick something up uh, and not have a bunch of shit that, that, that I'm relying on to do that. Yeah. You're going to walk around a weight belt your whole life. <laughs> I, you know, it's uh this reminds me, I totally forgot about this. When I first started working out as a kid, I used to hear this a lot from my family and I always thought it was the most strange, odd question ever where I started building muscle I started training, and my family family members would 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 tell me, "Well, well, what happens when you stop?" And I remember thinking to myself, "Like, well, what what do you think happens? Yeah, <laughs> it goes away." And they, "Well, that's why I don't want to do it because it yeah. goes away when you stop." Well, why and are you going to stop? There's not a single <laughs> listen. There's not a single skill that you could learn as a human that doesn't degrade if you stop practicing it. Right. It's just the bottom line. Look, stop talking for 15 years yeah. and then start talking again and see how your 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 language comes out. Like. Nothing works that way. Nothing. I always thought it was so strange that people would ask that because I'd look at them like, of course. It's the same thing that I used yeah, to get when, when I first started becoming a personal trainer in my, you know, when I was 20. 
And, you know, the, the critics would always say, well, what are you going to do when you get into your 40s and 50s? Exactly. That's my like, point. I'd be like, well, what do you mean? I'm still, you don't think there's there's people that need still training even yeah. as I get older? I don't, understand, I don't understand the question. They're just like, well, yeah, I mean, sooner or later you're going to get old. Your body's not going to be all buff and fit. I'm like, huh? Yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a, like, no, it's, I plan to lift my whole life. It's like, a yeah, practice. Dude. It's always a practice. The goal is to not lose any of these skills. Now, of course, the bottom line is age does affect the body so am i going to lose my ability to deadlift 550 pounds yeah probably mm. but what's more important to me is my ability to be able to deadlift mm -hmm. my ability to be able to move that way and feel good my ability to live a full life and to have good mobility um and that comes from consistent daily practice and i'll tell you what it's more important to exercise consistently when you get older than it was it is when you're younger. Mm -hmm. When you're younger, you're 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 kind of resilient, you know? You're like I can I see kids, you know, they eat garbage, sit around, do whatever, and it's like and they're kind of okay and then you train them a little bit and they change their diet and their body just magically transforms overnight. Uh, it doesn't necessarily happen that way as you get older. It takes a lot longer. So the consistency is even more, you know, as Adam would call it neuroticism. <laughs> it's more important <laughs> as you get older. Because as you get older, um, your body Obsession. wants to, your body actually wants to adapt in the opposite direction faster and faster and faster as you get older. When you're 50 and you stop working out, your body moves backwards really fast. When you're 20 and you stop working out, it moves back, but not so quickly. To the point where I used to have clients in their 70s, where you know they would train with me and we'd see some little progress, little progress, little progress, and then for whatever reason, sometimes they would stop. I wouldn't see them for like six months. They'd come back and it was like. Oh my God, you aged 10 years mm -hmm. in six months. Your body was just waiting for that opportunity to take everything back and then some. So um, your goal as you get older is the same goal you have now as when you're younger is can I continue to perform these very, very basic fundamental movements? And if I start to notice issues or problems with these with these movements, rather like what Justin said, rather than patching it up and throwing on a belt and you know rub, putting something around your elbow and rubbing Ben Gale over your body, Figure out why. Why is my deadlift starting to mm -hmm. feel more stiff? Well, why can't I squat as good as I used to? Fix the issues that are causing that and, and so that you can continue to do these. Well, this is this is exactly why we wrote Maps Prime Pro. And I know that it, it's it was probably one of the more confusing programs for us to 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 promote and and to get out there. A lot of people uh, confuse it with Prime and they think, oh, it's just a harder version. Like, no, it's completely different. And We've actually talked about renaming it because I think it's confused so many people. And really what it was designed to do, we go through seven uh, seven of the most uh, important joints in your body, and there's a test to do, and it's pass or fail. Either you can take that joint through its fullest range of motion with, with, control. Good, with good control and yes. strength, or you can't. And the truth is, most people will fail quite a few of those tests. And that's especially as you age, right? If you're 20, maybe, and you're limber, maybe you do all of them and you're like, oh, no big deal. But that's And that's normal for a very young kid. But as you get older, because you haven't been addressing these things, you, you're going to fail more of those tests. Now, the answer is when you fail, it isn't like, oh, I, now I just skip all these. No, in there, then from there, it shows you movements, mobility drills that you should do to help improve that and get better. And a perfect example is when we talk about squatting and deadlifting is the hip, the hips and ankle stuff, which is what I was talking about with the 90-90. Like 90-90 completely changed my squat, completely. It was just four years ago, you can go back and see old videos of me squatting, and I've got this really wide stance, and I can barely get down to 90 degrees. And what people don't see in the video is after I was done squatting, I was laying on the ground, I was grabbing my low back because it was on fire because my mechanics were off. And the the old version of me would have said something like, well, fuck, squatting is just not for me. I'll leg press instead and do leg session. That's the worst thing I could have done. The best thing would have been had I started doing what I'm doing now in my late 30s, back in my 20s when I first started noticing that, when I first started noticing the low back pain and the bursitis in my hips, instead of eliminating exercises that seem to make it worse, I should have tried to dig deeper into why is it making it worse? Why am I not able to do something as, as basic and functional mm -hmm. as a squat and work towards getting better in that? And that alone is a great goal for most people listening right now. Like that, if you could just overhead press, squat, and deadlift the rest of your life, and you did only those three movements and the stuff that you need to do to do those movements, 
you would be in a great place when you get older. Yeah, the the old adage you don't lose if you don't use it you lose it. Super super true. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.